Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good day. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step workshop. My name is Herb. I'm an alcoholic. Please uh, join me in prayer. As we've talked about, I've changed the set-aside prayer to include well, I thought I had the right slide up, but obviously I don't. So we will pray it, exchanging the word uh, brokenness for unmanageability. We will use unmanageability, at least I will. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, my unmanageability, my spiritual path in you for an open mind and a new experience with myself, my unmanageability, my spiritual path, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We're on step two. And following the method that we experienced that I hadn't planned for step one. We dedicated at the end of our discussion on step one an entire Tuesday night to a discussion of your experience, especially with unmanageability, but with the entire set of assignments on step one, including addiction, body and mind, as well as the spiritual malady, unmanageability. That, that worked out, at least from my standpoint, because there were a very robust discussion with you, the participants, about your experience and understanding and questions. And it was, so I'm, I'm following that with step two. So we're going to take a, a look at step two again in a deeper look. came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I'm just going to review the major highlights for us to prime the pump, as it were, so that you can bring uh, to us this group, this discussion about your questions and your comments, your knowledge, your experience, your challenges, whatever you feel uh, would be worthwhile for you to have a discussion about and especially bringing it to the community so that it might prompt their questions and or develop their experience with regard to step two. I have made a huge point. I hope you're understanding it, maybe having a new experience with step two. It's not in the big book as clear as it is on this slide, that step two is a decision. It's very clear in step three, the word is right in the step itself. But in step two, it's an assumption and a conclusion that I came to based on the way Bill sets it up, especially page 53. He says, God is or God isn't, what is your choice? And I phrase it this way, it's a decision, it's your decision, your unique decision not the big books, not your 12-step fellowship, not your sponsor, just you. You in the isolation, the solitude, hopefully, of your set-aside attitude and your set-aside prayer to make this decision. And I asked you to make that decision and write it out by this time. I asked, that was your assignment from last week. Is God necessary? That's a key question. And it's so relevant because, in fact, step two doesn't even have the word God in it. 
It's really my decision about my concept. I need power. I had the experience of no power in addiction. I had the experience of no power in unmanageability. At the very least, during the awareness of this journey in the assignments and in our community discussions, Bill uses the word bondage of self for unmanageability, the spiritual malady. This is my bullseye focus of my current consciousness is to try to peel back the curtains for the majority of people in the 12-step program who are not existentially aware of these definitions and this knowledge and this experience about unmanageability as the spiritual malady, as the problem. And when we connect to power, we get freedom. Now, there's a lot more work in front of us, of course. Step three is not work. Again, it's a decision and an experience, but it's the commitment to and an introduction to the whole path of recovery, steps four through nine, where we get to drop the bars to realize that there's no ceiling, no walls, no floor, that we're the ones that are holding the bars in front of our face in the delusion that we're in bondage. And we're only in bondage of self. That's not subtle. It might sound subtle. But once you finish your fifth step, you will know existentially again. I guess I'm into that word tonight. Experientially, a much better word. You will know experientially and in technicolor. The bondage of the bars that you created for yourself. Is God necessary? Bill went to great lengths in chapter four to welcome the atheists and the agnostics. Who is God? What is your question concerning power? Bill gives us an alternative, higher power. When we think about it logically, and it's the only way we can reflect on it logically, emotions don't really cut the deal. Logic is what we bring to this. Bill did in page 53, the question, God is or God isn't. And he had the questions on page 45, where and how are we going to find this power? And he answers that question on page 55. Deep down inside us, fully present. Is this uh, God, this power, Conscious, we use the term knowing. Is this God power caring? We're anticipating step three, in which that is the central word care of God. We don't turn our will and our life over to God. That would make no sense at all. We'll talk more about that and deeply about that when we get to step three. But we turn it over to the care. Is that a component of this power that you've been discerning about? An uncreated, creative reality. That's a contrast to the slide we showed you a lot earlier about who we are, which is a created reality. We are finite by definition. We have a beginning and we have end, and we're not all powerful and we're not all knowing. What is this life force that takes the acorn to the oak tree? A fabulous meditation. That organismic life force Bill calls it the spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things. He's a poet and he's a mystic in those comments. Look at that step. Step two, it's right from the book. 
not a mention of God. Capital P on power, which is a synonym. What's your decision, your concept? That's where we are right now. I wrote this in 1986, and it's still my conception of a higher loving power. And what, what came about was my sister told me, who had about five years of sobriety, she said, if you want to stay sober, you better figure out what your higher power is and write it down and keep it. <laughs> and, and so she was really bossy. She was my older sister. Uh, this is a photocopy of the original paper. <clears throat> I've kept it in my um, file cabinet since then. And my higher power, as I understand, is loving, nurturing, forgiving, gentle, wants me to be happy, joyous, and free, is consistent, always there, cares 100% of the time, reliable, makes plants and nature beautiful, takes care of animals, works in people's lives, and speaks through to me through people. And when you wrote that out and um, a, a poetic and beautiful uh, positive affirmation of power, um, and then you wrote out, how do you behave? Did you have any no experience with that? Did you do the assignment? Yes, I did the assignment. How do I behave? In I, light of I, what you just read, yes. Yes, I wrote very simply, um, I believe I am consistent in my behavior today and I'm really happy with who I am today. Okay, all right. I didn't feel very wordy. And also, I must have taken my sobriety very seriously in 1986 uh, because here's a photocopy. I kept the calendar of my sobriety date and I wrote last day on it. Um, nice, very good. I, I've never shared this with anybody ever. Yep, um, well, these are moments of uh, life changes for you. So they're treasures. That's right. Wonderful. Thanks so much. I wanted to share a bit what's going, what's uh, the concept of my higher power these days. <laughs> and it's different from last year. I mean, last year I was at a place where um, I just got employed and I really, my higher power was my employer with a capital E, like working, you know, for him. And uh, that was what I was yearning for, an employer that's inclusive, that's a provider, protector, et cetera. And since then I've been, I mean, this time around, what's really resonating with me is actually more feminine qualities. And I think last time, last Tuesday, you said, you know, you, you challenge us women to uh, have, you know, not be gender biased in terms of calling God he and uh, et cetera. But, and it, it, it um, I think it, it, it's, uh, you know, I meditated on it and what I'm, it really, really uh, set like sets sets deeply in me because um, in my in my in the past it's always been a father. I had a very good relationship with my father, so God was the masculine figure who's protecting, who's providing, who's uh, who's loving, but from a masculine perspective. And this time around. It's uh, because I, you know, um, and my mother, I had a very, she was very controlling, very overbearing. So I had a very hard time with uh, mm -hmm. that femininity. So God right now is, is, has feminine 
qualities. So I'm calling it the divine feminine. And it's, uh, it's a bit what Teresa has shared really. I mean, it's, it's knowing, it's nurturing, it's healing, it's cooling, it's receptive, it's compassionate, it's inward, it's loving, it's accepting, it's appreciative, it's sensual, it's wise. So um, that's what I'm embracing these days. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, and uh, I'm going to put a word on it. Most people probably have heard this, but since a wonderful articulation of uh, sort of an openness to having a new concept uh, and uh, a new experience with it, the uh, Greek Orthodox and the Greeks themselves have a feminine god they call Sophia, which is a term for wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you use that in your uh, vocabulary there. So um, it's, there's a precedence for it, the Sophia, wisdom, feminine spirit. So just wanted to reinforce your, your words and, and expand other people's knowledge about that, which you can't do this wrong. All you can do it is differently so that you have a, a robust experience with it. Last night, uh, some people shared their approach was to eliminate all human attributes. Now, there's a challenge. Because, of course, whatever it is, the human qualities don't really apply all we're doing is making a superhuman being out of God. I mean, it's wonderful, absolutely, and it's comforting, and it's something that we need. That's why we have pictures and icons and statues. Um, we need that kind of concreteness as long as we don't get into idolatry. So none of the words that you use are adequate. But they're wonderful, of course. It's just great poetry. It's great mysticism. It's great humanity. And yet, as Bill said in the big book, the words we use are inadequate. You know, and in the final analysis, yeah. No, thank you. I mean, also, because you always say that God is within us, right? We looked everywhere and we searched the world, whole world and at the end of the day, it sits within us. So these are kind of qualities that right. I am yearning to be, you know, also. That's a great insight, really seriously. Um, many people write this out as you have, most everybody has written out these attributes and these qualities and then Another insight is to step back and say, oh my, this is really a mirror reflection of who I aspire to be as a decent human being. And that, that expands it and explodes it in a wonderful vision statement. Yeah. What came up for me, Herb, is we did the exercise that you suggested, what do I believe about God now? So what do I believe about God now? What I tapped into is this idea that God doesn't have my back. God has abandoned me during these very challenging periods of my life, right? And then we did the exercise, and then the exercise of what attributes and qualities I do I want or need. Yeah. There I've created this beautiful higher power that has my back, that loves me, that protects me. So there's a disconnect between the two. Yes. So my question, okay, so that's normal, yeah. So then my question is, how it's do we... normal or not, but it's your experience. Yeah. It's my experience, yes. So what do I do with that? Yes. Just keep, keep with the process? Well, um, what is the final instruction of assignment concerning step two? I think it's assignment eight. What's the final, final bring it home instruction? Uh, how do I behave in light of what I believe? No, no, no. Mm -mm. Assignment uh, eight. Reread and highlight chapter four. This time highlight mark the phrases you can embrace that you resonate with. Okay, so I did that. No, it's item number three. Item number three. Oh, choose the attributes or qualities you need or want to be have. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, that's what I've done. Yeah, I've done yeah. that. All right, completed and that. so so that's your choice. Then you see, page fifty three, yeah. Bill says God is or God isn't. What is your choice? You're you you just wrote out what you want and what I choose, need, and okay. that's your choice. Now, now you, as I indicated in that faith sort of discussion, now you you're invited to act as if that's exactly what your God is. Okay. Step two is a decision about God. Now you're welcome to make that decision or not, but that's, you said what you want and need. So just decide, well, that's what it is then. Maybe, it. maybe it's not that clear in the instructions as I'm, as I'm articulating it. I'm seeing that I'm giving it a lot more flavor or, or color or depth to uh, my intention there, which is for each person to see what they need and want and to firmly convict themselves that that's what they're going to choose right now and operate for the balance of this step work as if the, that choice was based on reality, even though you have no certitude about it and no feeling about it. Or you might even have resistance to it and or even some uh, negative emotion about it, but it's what you need and want and you're choosing that that is the reality no matter what you think or want or feel rather. Does that make Got sense? It. That makes sense, Herb. I'm hearing you say it's time for me to choose, if I wish to, this new higher power. That's the essence of step two. And it's and it, maybe I've made it too complicated, but uh, that's the simplicity of the big book, is mm -hmm. you choose what you want and need, but the mm. key is then behave as if it's true. That mm. is, it is really your choice. Got it. And how do I assimilate this choice in my body, in my soul, in my heart, in my there's spirit? The, there's how the question. We... Well, uh, the, well, that's a great question. I hope everybody heard it and is asking themselves that question. And the answer is you begin to behave as if it's true. When you pray and meditate, that's where you're going. When you're aware and conscious, that's you built your tabernacle, now worship in front of it. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, it's an image that I was listening. I, I, I said it last night. Maybe people weren't there last night, so I'll say it again. I was listening to Bill Wilson, 1951, give a talk for an hour and a half. It was just fabulous. And um, he referred to... Alcoholics Anonymous as the tabernacle of the spirit. Alcoholics Anonymous, the tabernacle of the spirit. That's and beautiful. That knocked, that knocked me out. That's right. It is beautiful. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the dialogue in the early part of our discussion, because I hope it brought some clarification uh, to the intent of step two. And that was very important discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. My God is I understand my God. Of myself, I am nothing. I am powerless. Like the footprints in the sand, my God is there for me, never faltering. It is I who fell. My God is unconditional. I am never alone as I work on my relationship with him. My God lets me be gentle with myself as long as I don't rest on my laurels. He waits for my patient improvement. And as I grow spiritually, I transmute my God, and he transforms me in his likeness. That's a powerful insight, that last sentence. Would you repeat that, please? As I grow... Or phrase, anyway, yeah. As I grow spiritually, I transmute my God, and he transforms me in his likeness. Yeah, I'm going to translate for somebody that, that might not understand transmute gets change. My God, my concept of God doesn't change. But my concept of God changes in this, in almost proportion and correlated to the way I am changed. That's really what you're saying. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
I've been doing some prayer meditation and my concept of God today is the space in which I live, everything on earth, including all human things that are human and non-human and everything that is. That's my concept of God. It, it, it is fire, it's rain, mm -hmm. it's um, the universe, the mountains, well, all the it's, things uh, material. It's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's poetic, it's metaphysical, it's mystical, it's great, it's great. And it speaks to the unity and oneness of all reality. It's just wonderful. So now what do you do with that? How do you translate that into your behavior going forward? I believe if I continue in Alcoholics Anonymous, I continue in the inventory and looking at who I am, I can re rightly relate myself to my environment and everything in it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, I think that's the essence of the transformation that takes place. The first three steps are about our relationship with power. The next four steps, four through nine, uh, four through seven, are a relationship with ourself. And the next three steps, literally uh, eight, nine, and 10, are a relationship with other people. I, you're spot on. It will change us in our relationships to all aspects of reality. That's what Bill means by a spiritual awakening, that kind of change. I'm a skeptic. And so I have to go back to what the thing that works for me is to go back and look at what the 12 steps did for me and what it did for my brother who brought me in and things like, like I have a friend who just came into the, I'm a food addict, by the way, who I've known for over 30 years. So I had to stick around the rooms that long for her to show up. So for me, it's it, uh, it's it, it, it's just that it's what I've seen happen for my brother and for me. And then there's things also serendipitous things, and maybe it, like when I've been the person to show up at a thing, and I was the right person to be there for a friend, and then. Uh, I, I don't behave as if I've got that kind of, I absolutely do not. I get full of fear. Um, and so, so that's why I think when I was, well, anyway, when I was writing about it, I'm trying to do something that I can actually believe in Yeah. because I'm such a or, or, skeptic. Or, or want to believe in. Right. Right. And so that, I don't know, that's why. Yeah. This last thing. And then also, remembering you know the series of events that happened that made me be in a particular place when so that I would go to 12 step recovery I saw things happen in my family so and, rather than rather than a historical description yeah which is, which is you know that's how you get where you're at what's the answer to the step 2 question for you. Well, yeah. Uh, that I'm supported, I'm guided, I'm safe now. Uh, and I provide safety for myself. Yeah, you know, uh, there's one other thing. I have this little card that a friend bought, brought me and it's, it's a picture of the Virgin Mary and it says, if you know how much I love you, you'd cry of joy. <laughs> That's the one that touches my heart. Yeah. And then on the back, it says, without me, God's plans cannot be realized. And that sort of relates to like the way 12 step people show up or hang around till another newcomer comes yeah. Yeah. who we can help. And that speaks to the feminine energy of this. Mm of this spirit yeah that's yeah wonderful. that's wonderful yeah. yeah yeah all right and 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 again each one of us has to excuse me is invited to you don't have to do anything but is invited to bring it to a conclusion 
and and write it out as to this is my decision and now going forward this is may 25th going forward in this work especially i'm going to act as if that decision was absolutely scientific yeah there's really where the rubber meets the road yeah to use a hackneyed phrase but that's really literally what we're going to do next assignment is looking at step oh and that be, reminds me assignment number nine is where we're going i'll be talking about that we're moving on to step three next week uh items number one and two and uh and three especially pay attention it's a short read from page 58 to 63 so read it all but pay particular attention to 58 to 60 because okay. that's what I'll be unpacking next next week. Uh, one word, one phrase, one sentence at a time, because it's really dense material. It's an explanation of how does it work. And uh, obviously, the brings us to step three, which is that decision to turn, which is based on the decision of step two, which is, in fact, about a power Step three is a decision about a relationship with this power. Now, these aren't words from the big book, but you'll see how I come to that conclusion when we begin unpacking what is in the big book. Okay. Thanks very much. You know, when I came into AA, I was an, an agnostic. Um, and in the last year, I've definitely had a huge change. Um, and I've gotten to the point where I love to talk about God with everybody and anybody to hear what their thoughts are. And it just blows my mind that so many people, it's, they don't really want to go there for some reason. And I don't understand it when it seems like God is such an, a massive, important thing in our lives. Um, anyway, um, so... Well, I, the guess, answer to, I don't want to interrupt, but I am yeah, going to because you raised a wonderful question and, 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 and maybe it was rhetorical. No, no. Why do people have a resistance to or a negative attitude? It's because of their exposure and experience to organized religion. Or somebody who is, in fact, connected to organized religion. Right. All right. right. And, 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 and so that's where it comes from totally understandable and you'll hear it as people sh become very vulnerable and share their 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 history yeah so go ahead okay thank you that that's actually thank you for answering that yeah um and so you know you've referenced einstein's quote that you know the mind that caused the problem is not the one that's going to solve it or the intelligence if i'm qu quoting the quote right yeah um i didn't realize until this last year that that Einstein was apparently a philosopher mystic as well. And, and so anyway, so like the science aspect, like that's referenced in the book, you know, atoms, you know, a long time ago, we thought atoms were the smallest item in the world and in, in the universe. And then it was like, okay, electrons, protons, neutrons, then subparticles. And it, you know, it just got me thinking that if, if E equals MC squared, and I think everything in the universe is God. And if, if everything can either be mass or energy, it's just basically the same thing in just different forms. And so my concept right now is just that God is everything. It's this, this energy that we can or can't see. You know, it's, it's just pervasive everywhere. And so, you know, my, my qualities, though, are a kind, loving, compassionate God. Um, and so, you know, um, I feel like when I act as if I'm really just increasing the, the level of love in the world as opposed to decreasing negativity. Um, and so anyway, uh, I don't know. You're, you're shut up there. No, no, no. Though that's the reflection. All right. You're on it. Allow it to have its way with you. Stay with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, 
then answer the question as I probably will challenge everybody to, because it's just a great reminder. And that is, how are you going to, or at least how would you like to translate that into action going forward while we're in this workshop at least? Yeah. And that's rhetorical. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, no, no. Wonderful. You're Stay with it. Let it bubble. <laughs> yep. You know, I've given this a lot of thought and I could change this whole thing tomorrow. Of but course. I wrote out I wrote out some of my thoughts. And I think that God does not live outside of me, that God is in me, and God is in all of us. And God is my heart, God is my mind, God, God is me, just as I am God, I live in God in the same way. And nothing can separate me from God. The core of my, my problems is that there can be a separation between us. And this doesn't exist. That God is always with me. And there is no problem that God can't solve if I can get in touch with that spirit of God in me. Um, and he will guide me to the right action and to do the right thing. And truthfully, if I can remind myself and get in touch with the God inside of me, um, it puts me in alignment. Like you say, if we do the right thing, our actions guide us to, if we are in touch with God and we can remember that, then our actions will be in alignment with that. And if we're in alignment, our lives generally will go okay because we'll understand that we're living on life's terms, not our terms, that we aren't the center of the universe. We are the center of our universe only. Um, and that thing, when you get out of alignment is when you get into trouble, when you use, when you marry somebody who's using, when your kids start using, everything goes haywire. It's all chaotic because there is a rhythm. There is a spirit. There is a, to my thinking, there is a, um, like a force, like a, a uh, energetic force, like a strength, centrifugal force that's spinning so fast and we're flat up against it. When we pull ourselves off of it is when we're, we're off the track. And, and I have lived almost a whole life and in my life, every time I've pulled myself off the track, I am off the track. Right. And when I live within the track, things seem to go in a beautiful way. And this program has really taught me an awful lot about myself. And it's been hard to admit so many things I've done wrong that I really thought I was doing right. And right. now it's almost embarrassing yeah. <laughs> to yeah. be so, and I was so firm about it. Like, you know, I would fight to my death <laughs> to right. get to my point. Well, and, and many, things. People, many people do. They, they fight to the death in their delusions about being right and they didn't know that they didn't know what you're right. talking about is i call the flow when you're in a life right. you're in the flow and we can call it a variety of names and and you you started off talking about the separation i, I don't believe right. separation is possible the problem that we have as human beings is the delusion that we're separate Right. That's the whole point of step uh, four through seven is to remove the obstacles in us that create the delusion that we're separate from this power. That makes perfect sense because it's that not being believing that you really aren't a part of it, that you can separate from it is the problem. That's the problem. Yes. That's and that's the brilliance. Four I mean, I just read step 12 in the 12 and 12. It just blew my mind. I, was, I have read that before. Yeah. I mean, I know it's off the track, but this book, these two books um, for everybody here, they just keep going. It just keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. They're alive. These books are alive. They're living organisms. Well, that's actually the book isn't, but you are. Okay. And every time you read it, you, there's a new consciousness. You're reading with yeah. light. It's incredible. Yeah. When that light comes in and you see it in a different way, it's like, yeah. ah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy your enthusiasm and your excitement, and I share it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
I've written out many lovely descriptions of my higher power and the you know various times I've been through the steps and various fellowships. Um, and they're none of them not true, but something never clicked. And the click was when you said, well, how would you, you just connected that, well, how would you behave if? And I'm like, wait a minute, I actually know this because 15, 20 years ago, well before any notion of alcoholism, sobriety, whatever, well, probably was a notion, but well before I came in, I came up with through a series of, you know, whatever readings and study, um, basically like a, a life, like a mission statement, I guess you could call it. And the mission statement was, and I wish I could remember the formula for coming up with it, but it was to be a joyful conduit of truth, beauty, and love, nice. period. And every time I came back to revisit it, it was like, no, nothing changed. Nothing changed. Every time that's all I wanted. And truth especially resonated with me, which is interesting because I'm a big liar. Um, but <laughs> so, maybe that's why you're focused on it because it's what you really need. Like, there must, must be some way I can get at this truth thing. But here's the thing. So then I have all this other idea. And I love also what Kent brought up because it is exactly true. I had idea first, oh, these people in this church around me actually believe this stand up, sit down, kneel, pray, stand up, sit down, kneel, pray. And I'm just going through the motions, yeah. but I'm going to be polite and just do these things because whatever. And this is all possibly true, but there was just no connection for yep. me. Yep. And then I started, well, there's probably is something out there. And I know I've had these demonstrations that God exists, God, you know, I could list them off but we won't go into my story but the connection was oh what if i believe that all these things were and i can read it's very brief what if my power higher power with was has to be an all loving generous understanding patient and wildly creative power i can turn to draw upon lean into and who will hold me in its care when i cannot and that's the key because great it's all this power and it's genius but if i can't access it either because i have something blocking me or because i forget or what, whatever stupid reason i have as a human being with so many busy things to do um the idea that this patient loving higher power is just there kind of got my back the whole time just waiting 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 and pushing you know shepherding See, me along. we are we are organically delivered to step three that's mm -hmm. what you're talking about Mm -hmm. so you're talking about taking this concept which you created it's on paper mm -hmm. and then saying oh i can have a relationship with that correct that's where it happens in step three and i'll show it's not written the way i just articulated it but i'm going to show you bill is encouraging us to have a relationship he gives us in fact five models at the bottom of page 62 and the two paragraphs on page 63, he gives us illustrations of models of a relationship. He doesn't use this terminology, so we have to get underneath it, and you'll see that when we unpack it in the next couple of weeks. Well, guess who's looking forward to that? <laughs> well, see, but we're, th that's the magic of this step process. It's like tongue in groove to speak in a carpenter's language. It's organically. Step one, if you, if you do step one, you are organically catapulted into step two. And if you have an experience with step two, you are catapulted forward into step three. He said on page 25, rocketed into a fourth dimension. We got into the rocket. And now the rocket's taking us where it's going to take us. Yeah. And you know, the interesting is it loses the stages when you least expect it. You get those boosts, right? <laughs> it's like, oh, because like, well, nothing's happening. I guess that's the end of the ride. Oh, nope. Here we go again. That's Every exactly. time I doubt. But then that's what if I could just act as if, like you said, what were the actions I'd take if I believed it? That's it. That's it. And that surprise, that's yeah. a spiritual awakening. A week ago, we had an old van in our business with over a half million miles that we were selling. And I took a deposit from a man and he was going to come back last Friday for the, to pay the balance and to get the pink slip. A day later, another man came and said, I want this van and I'll give you $500 more. And I was so conflicted because one, $500, I wanted the $500, but also the second man really had a need for it and I related to him and he was, I, I, I wanted him to have it, but I kept 
wrestling with it and I prayed about it and I talked to my sponsor about it, a spiritual advisor. And I knew that if I, if I backed out of the first one after I had taken a deposit for the express reason to hook that man and say, you can't get out, that I would be dishonoring God. And like you said, you either, God is either in this 100% and gets the whole enchilada or not. And, you know, the obsession to drink and use was removed from me a long time ago by I choose to say God. And then two and a half years ago, compulsive overeating, the same thing. So I knew what to do, but I couldn't pull the trigger. And today, this man approached me again. This, the, second, the first man was supposed to pick it up today because... On Friday, he said, I can't pick it up. I have to go to church. I have to pray to my God. And I said, well, I may want to sell it before. They said, you do what you want to do, but I'm going to honor my God. And today, the, the second man said, well, I know that van belongs to me. I know you want to sell it to me. And I said, no, I have to honor my God. I have to do what's right. And when the first man, when I called him and said, two, hour, two hours later, you're supposed to be here to pick it up. And he said, Somebody stole my other van and a catalytic converter. If that other guy is still interested, why don't you sell it to him? And the second man came tonight, gave me a $500 deposit, and will complete the transaction tomorrow. Let God be the hero of the story, Herb. That was a spiritual well, experience. Well, you know, and, and it's nice. God gets a lot of credit that he's not due and a lot of blame that God's not due. Um Underneath that story is you're a man of integrity who operates on principle, and you don't need always, blame or blame or credit God. Quite frankly, you but can, I didn't always operate that way. Well, but you you know now that there are principles that if in fact you transgress them, you will be crushed. So you are in alignment with your understanding of the principles of reality. When you say that, it reminds me who said. It's one thing to know better, but you have to do better. That, that, well, it, 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 life works a little bit better in the flow when you do. <laughs> well, right. for, yeah. for to me today, this was like a spiritual experience because it, yeah. I, yeah. Well, it, it's a, it's a com complete confirmation of your commitment to a path of principles. And, and yes, your consciousness is what is allowing you to honor your principles. But no drug ever felt this good. No alcohol. Or, or last this long with such positive effects. That's right. I, exactly. So, And I give a lot of credit to your workshops because yeah. in regular AA meetings, you know, I heard things like honest-ish and, you know, sober-ish, and that's not what I get here. So I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing and witnessing that this really works. This stuff really works in, in practical life. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. I have no problem defining uh, my higher power, but when I try and act as if <laughs> I have to say there's, a, there's definitely a loss of self. I'm really invested in not having a higher power. It feels unsafe. I feel like I'm leaving myself exposed. Mm -hmm. um, What's your concept of higher power then? Well, kindness, patience. No, it isn't. no, no, it isn't. No, no, that's your fantasy. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, my higher, uh, my, what I, my, I guess what, you're asking what I believe my higher power is right now. Well, your behavior has revealed it. So we'll put some words to it. Sure. Uh, well, I guess fearful, not trusting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you write out what you want and need? Yeah. What did you write in there? A big fantasy. <laughs> well, no, no, no. It's a vision. Now I'm changing it to a vision statement. <laughs> okay. Well, that's... But you notice the difference. See, the fantasy yeah. is, is what you believe you believe when, in fact, you're in fear. But... The vision statement is what I want or need, and now I'm going to make every effort to act as if that's actually really true. It's a vision statement that will lead me in my behavior progressively. Not, not, a, not at first. I will still be habituated to the fear kind of, but it might lessen. It might lessen as I envision this 
a, a, a decision that I'm making. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you. Okay. So um, what I uh, what I have is um, kind, patient, wise. Uh, instill peacefulness, um, uh, provide, um, uh, let me feel empowered, confident, provide guidance, protect, um, acceptance, supportive, friendly, humorous, replenishing, and fearless. See, the, a couple words that stood out to me, and it's, of course, it's my own selector, but it's um, the guidance and the power this is the way step 11 is constructed, isn't it? The end of step 11 says, praying for the knowledge of God's will and the power to do it. That's, for me, that's what I want. I want guidance, and then I want to be empowered. And I'm going to act as if it's true that, in fact, I can rely on the guidance that I get. And in taking the actions that I will somehow receive the power to be effective. But so what does it mean to you from a practical standpoint, what, what you're just saying and what I'm just saying? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I can say intellectually, I think what, uh, what you're saying um, is what I need to do, but it's hard for me to do because I, I am fearful. <laughs> All right. So what would it look like if your fear were just reduced a little bit? Incrementally, what would it look like behaviorally? Um, oh, uh, more lighthearted. All right. All um, right. Do less, you pray? Not enough. <laughs> Well, no, that wasn't an answer to my question. That yes, was I did. That was an apology for your guilt. <laughs> All right. So do you pray? Yes. And when do you pray? In the morning. All right. Wonderful. And what do you, in, in a general uh, sense, what do you uh, pray? A serenity prayer. Nice. In Wonderful. fact, I do serenity prayer multiple times a day. <laughs> All right. All right. I can. Um, yes, I can um, imagine that. What about the set aside prayer? You know what? I have not been doing set aside prayer except for here. All right. All right. Is that something that you're willing to incorporate into your morning practice? Yes. May I suggest you do that on your knees? Yes, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just suggesting it. And the man who said, who took me through the steps the first time, I mean, I'm a traditional Catholic, knees and you heard somebody else explain it. Yeah. Up, down and sit and ground and grind <laughs> and groan. Oh my God. But he said, we get on our knees not to get God's attention. We get on our knees to get our own attention. It's an act of humility. I did that. I don't pray on my knees now. I haven't for 25 years. Um, I just, it's not comfortable and it's distracting to me. But during this, the time that I did the steps in 1988, I did pray for that year every day on my knees in the morning, just a short period as an act of humility and commitment to my, my decision. Well, I will definitely try it this week. You know, I guess that's really my invitation and uh, your openness to try it is the, that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, thank right? you. Yeah, thanks very much. Again, the conversation that we're having is something that just expands the discussion in such a productive and practical way. So thank you so much for bringing this into the public forum, all of you who are sharing today. Wonderful. I had the most wonderful, I'm getting goosebumps, the most wonderful 24 hours that I've had in a long time. Um, it seems like every Monday I get a disturbance, which was yesterday. And I'm thinking, oh, there's Herb again. <laughs> and Are you it, saying I'm your disturbance? No, I'm just thinking you bring out my questions, the disturbance, uh -huh. right? 
All right. Well, that's a that's a compliment. It's a high compliment. Oh yes, like I'm thinking, damn, here I am again. Yeah. And and I'm thinking, I have never had faith. I thought I had faith, right. but I don't have faith because I don't act as if, or I don't act like I have faith, right? So that was my disturbance, and I thought, damn it, there we go again. Okay, so then I got thinking about what my conception of a higher power would be and it is he or she source is my bastion of grace peace and security kindness faith he is he is all to me greatly and well countenanced in my heart he's in me for me and around me and he is my higher power I always say he I maybe will change that one day but my power he is my bodyguard my mind guard my will guard and my spiritual guard okay all right but so so rather than continue on with your long list what does it mean to you going forward? It means a, a totally different life and experience going forward. And I'm at peace with it now. What I've, my concept, which I've not been at peace with it before. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a presence as you described it. A summary, that one word, presence, yeah. all-pervasive presence. And the, the translation is trust. That yeah. on a daily basis, you trust that that's so. Yeah. And interestingly enough, trust was broken for me many, like when I was three or four years old. For most of the people on the call, trust is a huge issue. I can guarantee it. And that's exciting for me because I didn't know I didn't trust. That's correct. And now I have something I can trust. Yes. Yeah. And well, what, but what does that mean then for you practically that you can trust it, but how would you manifest trust? That's a good question. Okay. I don't know. All right. So you hold the question. Maybe other people will comment on it. All right. Because I'm raising the question for you, but everybody else also. All right. Yeah. Because I want to make this very practical. This isn't a course in theology. This is a, this is a course in awakening. Yeah. Yeah. And Oh, brilliant. So I had a big turnaround in 24 hours. It was amazing. Well, wonderful. Okay. Be prepared to be amazed. I usually say surprise, but I'll just piggyback on your word. Be prepared to be amazed regularly. Was, oh, yeah. Like I was so thrilled. I thought, oh, my God, it's a total 360 from yesterday, last night's disturbance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. So every time I think I... I've got a thought put together. You ask a great question and then my mind goes whirling. But for me, this I, I've been struggling because um, it truly was came to believe. I've been around program for a thousand long time. Um, and I kept waiting for a, a bolt of lightning to hit me um, because I thought that's what I, God was going to do, right? right. And I, I spent over 20 years wandering, waiting for this bolt. Yep. Um, um, and then it was something around reading, reading the, the spiritual thing at the back of the book and um, realizing that there's a personality change. And then I thought, shit, I've had that personality change. I think I must have a power greater than myself. Yeah. Um, but I kept looking and searching and searching. And when I had that realization and thought, what has God done for me that I couldn't do for myself? And I could look back and 
and see, I mean, I hadn't had sugar. Some of my relationships were, were changed. I, I realized that something was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. So then maybe I had to come to believe, right? That, that there, was, there was something. And where was it? Just like you read, it was inside of me. Um, so it took me a long, long time to get there. And then I have this picture of what it looked like. And it's, you know, Gandalf, the man, magnificent from Lord of the Rings and, you know, guide and loving and all that stuff. But, but, um, but I had to, I just struggle. And then what stops me is self-will. I don't know if there's anybody else here that's got that, but I slam that sh- that door my self will just gets in the way and I and God goes out and I want what I want um and then it takes me a while to 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 come back and what's really helped me was years ago and um something happened um when my father passed away that was a sign that kind of God was it and it's a it's a special number in my family and I see that special number you asked the question about practicality that number shows up on the clock it shows up in the stove it shows up on a on a on a car license and i take it to mean that god's talking to me because i need something tangible sure. um and yeah. so whenever i see that number i say okay god what is it that you want me to do it doesn't mean that my self will doesn't get in the way but yeah. for that moment i feel that There is a power somewhere greater than me that's talking to me, that's sending me a sign. And and I, you know, the last person you talked about, how do you manifest trust? I try to try to figure out, like, what might that be? Like, how how do I need to behave in the moment? Because God's sending me a message. And sometimes it could be when I'm thinking I should go eat a whole bunch of shit that I shouldn't eat according to my food plan, because I'm a food addict. And the damn number goes by in a car and it's like god's telling me don't do that right but i have to be open and that's what i've started saying that um the the praying um the set aside prayer now in the morning um every with my other prayers um and i think that's helping but i still i don't know i i I, it's that self-will it's like i still want to run the show (laughs) i know there's a power there's something there but I still want what I want. There's 144 people on this call and 144 are self-centered. But you know, <laughs> I'm not alone. <laughs> that's our community. That yeah, well, I appreciate community. it. I appreciate it. And that's my goal is to be a little bit less self-centered. And that's, <laughs> that's my, cool. what I'm, what I'm hoping. But, but, but that's my practicality. I have this number and I believe that's God speaking to yeah. me. Yeah. Well, and 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 uh, I'll make it even more concrete. God manifests as the present moment. Mm. So every mm. moment is the presence of the evolution of the divinity. Mm. There's a thought that'll take you deep into your solitude. For sure. I'll yeah. be think, thinking about that one every but but that but that is for me a manifestation which really helps me it's great thanks thank you so much i had an i just remembered an experience i had her and at the time i had it this is years ago about 20 years ago the time i had it i thought i was going insane because i have siblings who are schizophrenic three siblings who are schizophrenic and i pushed the experience away even though it was delightful and now I'm just realizing that that was real. And here's the experience. I was driving in this beautiful countryside. I was on my own for a month and driving through this countryside. And I had the experience that God was looking at the world through my eyes Mm -hmm. and was delighted to see his creation through my eyes. And I was delighted with him or it or whatever. (laughs) And it was the most amazing experience. And it scared me because I thought, I've never had this experience before. And, um, but now that's what I want. I want, because one of the things I wrote down that I want is a conscious companionship with my creator. And, um, 
and um, I think that was like an, an awakening, but the actual official term for what you had was a spiritual experience. That's what Bill Wilson had in his room, uh, that mountaintop experience. And, and it's a legitimate mystical experience. A lot of people, unfortunately, tr chase it as, as a feeling or an experience that gives them a sign that they're connected to God. Whereas oh. Appendix 2 is very clear awareness of the presence of God is the essence of a spiritual experience. So step 11 has it phrased correctly. We pray and meditate to improve our conscious contact. That's the whole point of it. Not a feeling, uh -huh. but this consciousness, this awareness right. of the presence of God. Now that was a gift and embrace it, lean into it, remember it, cherish it. It's wonderful. But don't chase it because when we yeah, chase yeah. that feeling, we chase it away. Because if we, it, because it's a concept now, and it, and it's a memory, and it's not here it's, now. And 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 think of it as as a gift. That's all a gift. You okay. didn't earn it. You didn't earn it. There's nothing okay. that you did. Obviously, you're driving, and you have this awareness, and it's a moment. It's just a wonderful moment for you. Okay. Okay. And uh, yeah, thank you. So thank you very much for sharing that. With us. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I need to renovate the conception of God that I have in my head. I agree a hundred percent. All of us do. Yes. Um, I sometimes think of him as a highway patrolman with a gun that is sitting there. You bet. Watching if you're, you're going fast. He's going to come you and get you. Bet. Yep. You bet. Lots of people have that from their family of origin or from their religious tradition. Absolutely. And the whole point of this exercise is for you to identify that and then to choose what you want. Well, yet I dare to talk to him every day. I pray to him every day. And um, why? Because I believe in him. Uh, no, no. I understand that you believe in a, a, some sort of a reality, but why do you pray? Because I believe without him, nothing is possible. That's not an answer to my question. Why do you pray? Why don't you just acknowledge God thanks, hi, and, and not pray? Why do you pray? Because I ask for his help. Okay. All right. So you're in a relationship of a communication of friendship. Wonderful. Great. Of course. I always ask for his help. I ask for from him to give me wisdom to continue in my life. So un underneath that prayer then is some intuition that help is available? Of course, yes. Well, but that's not the highway patrolman. No, well, you didn't let me finish. My <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes see him as the guy on the motorcycle with his speed gun and uh, then, uh, I don't know, as a beautiful uh, being that he's there to lift yeah. me and, and help so me. The, the point and of the, many different pictures. I understand. Of I understand. And you're, I mean, everybody really can identify with that. We're very ambivalent sometimes uh, and, and, and uh, go in two different directions. But, but the, point, the exercise of step two is you've identified all of this, these dimensions the, the final exercise, and it was at the very beginning of the workshop tonight, it, was got, it got really clear, and thanks for the prompting of our, our group. The final exercise of step two is answering the question, what do you want? And then that's what you focus on as the reality. I ask God to make me a no, what do you want in, in terms of a concept of God? That You, you missed the oh. question. What do you oh, want see. as a concept of God? Oh, right. What do you well, want? I to change the concept of him to a forgiving right. and kind uh, being at all times, not punitive. All right. So if, in fact, you actually believe that that was so, that what you just said was in fact the reality, how would that change your behavior? 
I, I feel if I had that uh, reality, that change in me, I would be very, very close to him. So that's the practical translation that you trust your decision that in fact, that's the reality for you right now. And you're going to operate that way in gratitude every day. And you're mm -hmm. going to resist the temptation to image the highway patrol person. You're going to focus on the image of this benevolent, generous, supportive, helping power. Correct. I, uh, I feel even when bad things happen in my uh, daily whatever, it is meant to be because he wants it to be. Maybe there's a lesson in there for me. Right. And that's a positive attitude that there's an opportunity there in this challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like uh, being the impatient person that I am is teaching me uh, to be patient by getting right. stuck in traffic. Well, you can, you can write fun. any story you want about it, but it's, it's really basic psychology as well as theology that if you focus on the positive, eventually you become more positive in your thinking and your feeling and your behavior. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I really want to thank you for being the person that you are. Thank you. Well, I'm going to thank you for standing and having this dialogue with me because I've been very hard on you. You That's acknowledged good. it and you didn't, you didn't flinch. You didn't blame me. You didn't get angry. You opened yourself up to the conversation. That's for me, that's the sign of authentic willingness and spirituality. So I really do appreciate that acknowledgement from you. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah thank you. Here's my uh, definition of uh, what I do believe about God. I believe that God is this universal omnipresent energy uh, based on love, understanding, and acceptance. It is the, the energy which provides me the opportunity to act accordingly to all of these uh, three components within this universal energy. The components being uh, love, understanding, acceptance. And uh, how do I act when I'm connected to this energy? I'm open to others. I help when I'm asked to do so. And in brackets, I put down, sometimes I try to help even when I'm uh, not asked to do so. And uh, every time I do that, my experience tells me not to pursue this uh, this way because it doesn't go the right way. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful sensitivity. <laughs> and uh, how do I feel when I'm connected to this energy? And sometimes, uh, especially since I'm in this workshop, sometimes I, I actually feel I, I'm part of it. Not my body, but my um, my inside or my myself. Uh, I feel calm, confident, helpful. I'm open to uh, life as it is. Um, and uh, if I'm <clears throat> I'm grateful for who I am. And that's, that's a huge step for me uh, because I wasn't taught to love myself. I was more taught to punish myself yeah. uh, or be punished, uh, more, uh, maybe more be punished. Um, and uh, so uh, the gratefulness for who I am, uh, what I have, uh, and not necessarily material, 
and uh, including my health. Other comments, when I'm not connected to God and I, I kneel every morning to open the door, I need to do that because I tend to want to, I almost walked away from the program three times in my life. And that was a mess. The last time was a huge mess. I didn't go uh, uh, drug, I didn't go uh, consume alcohol, uh, but uh, uh, life was miserable. I, m I might as well have. Yeah. Uh, recently, I had a discussion with my sponsor, and uh, it ended up being I tried all kinds of remedies. Uh, uh, throughout my life. Uh, the first one was uh, drinking uh, alcohol. Uh, and this, uh, uh, when that didn't work, I, um, I uh, <clears throat> consumed drugs. And when that didn't work, I, I ran away all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, when I'm not connected to God, I have a short fuse. I'm not accepting. I want either to run away, uh, even from myself, or to ignore others. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but see, even there, the the sense and or feeling of not connecting is a delusion. The whole purpose of this process of the steps is to bring you into conscious contact with that which you are always in constant contact. That's the whole point of it. So there's step two, and people have talked about all around me and all in me and everywhere. There's no place that there is not God. We just forget to remember. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, and that's my running away. Well, and, or or drugs and, and, and alcohol, they're all running away. Yeah. And the only remedy, uh, I'll pursue the discussion with my sponsor a few days ago. The only remedy in all of those, the only remedy that works and keeps on working is my belief in my higher power. And, uh, and my uh, will to maintain a relationship with my higher power. So every morning, because I'm hard headed, every morning I have to kneel. I kneel at the same place at about the same time and I open the door. Yeah, no, I tend, I, yeah, I think I that tend the, to the, shut the door and yeah. want to walk. The, the two things that keep us connected, consciously connected, one is, as you say, prayer and meditation, and the other is what you said also, is helping somebody else. Yes. Because when I'm helping somebody else, I'm constantly connecting to a power that is between us. Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. During the set aside prayer is completely been changing everything in my life. I don't even can't even express it. But suddenly I had this image. I just remembered my son was about 10, and I had been exposed to the teachings of Byron Katie. And I began practicing the staying centered and focused. And he came in and he was angry. And he walks and he says, I hate you. I hate this house. I hate everything. And he goes into his room and he slams the door and he's banging the windows and he's doing everything. And I'm in the kitchen. I'm just doing what I have to do. Remembering this is my son. This is my son. I love him. I was crazy over him. I waited many years because I was able to have this son. And I just stayed focused on what I was doing, preparing him his supper. And so he slammed the door, just like I do. And then he opened the door and he said, Ema, can you make me some supper? And that's how I see God. I slam the door. He doesn't open it. He doesn't force me to open it. But then when I open it, yeah. And that, that, that's what I want. I wrote, I want an ever-present awareness of his presence. That's all I want.
That's what I want. I just want to have that awareness. And he's there no matter what I do. I have the freedom. That's what I love about it. It's giving me the freedom. I feel that freedom. I don't have to, nothing. I'm free. So grateful. Well, you're welcome. And that's why I suggest the image also along that line, and you're reminding me of it, is of the dimmer switch. And we lean gently against the dimmer switch, gently leaning and just pushing it up gently one notch at a time so that the lights go a little brighter with each click, with each notch, with each day. And eventually there's enough light for us to see more and then we just continue to lean gently against the dimmer switch so that it progressively goes up. And the really good news is the light is infinite. So there's never going to be any end to the progressive increase of the light as long as we're alive and leaning gently against that dimmer switch. It's just a, it's a such a comforting thought along the line that you're just talking about. Yeah. You know, I find myself taking that deep breath. Yeah. And, oh. Yeah. I had an interesting epiphany gifted to me today. Uh, and it came up because you were just saying sometimes by giving to others, we actually are the ones getting. And I'm one of those people who doesn't quite lean gently into anything. <laughs> I tend to turn Nobody, it on. And nobody's shut. surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to turn it on all the way and then shut my eyes and demand that it's off. And yeah. Um, but something has always, for the past three or four years that I have been just daring the fear of God to do its worst to me and just kind of flipping it off and hoping to laugh with it afterwards, which has so far for the most part happens. I just forget sometimes that it happens. Um, that there's been a little piece of me that's always a little scared. Am I being fake? Am I faking it? And I think that's kind of why I use Waldo because at least then I don't feel like I am like being profane or something, you know? Mm -hmm. And today... Of course, I'm talking to a sponsee who doesn't want to go to her in-laws. And I'm like, okay, what if it's a do-over? What if you don't have the chance to go to your in-laws and this is a do-over and you're just going to do it the best you can? And she said, well, wouldn't that be faking it? I was like, I don't know that there's such a thing. And what I said to her, and I'm playing it back in my head now, and it's just ridiculously ironic. I said, what if by leaning into your pretend best self you're actually uncovering your real self yeah what if by putting up that fourth wall you're actually breaking it down yeah yeah and I mean, I get chills because I was saying it to somebody else I wasn't hearing it in that moment but I couldn't avoid Yep. Hearing my own yep. annoying yep. voice in my ear during this conversation saying, is it faking it? Do you even know what fake is? You yep. think you can control who you are and faking it? Yeah. Yeah. In, in the fourth step, I suggest something parallel to that. I talk about the stretch. Step outside the boundaries of sanity and common sense and see what's out there. And it's surprising what happens. And that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, those 12 words, if you try to keep an open mind, yeah. you will find help. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think it really. Yeah. So yeah. thank you for opening and expanding minds. You're Appreciate welcome. It, yeah. And help will find you. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, tonight we'll end with uh, serenity prayer. Please join me. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. And wisdom to know the difference. 
You're an awesome group, wonderfully robust conversation. And there's more next week.